Hello and welcome back to Vlandigan Night Adventures. And, uh, well, I've actually been tinkering, or tinkering, <laughs> tinking? No, haven't been tinking. I've been thinking a little bit, but n no, that's actually not what I intended to say. Anyway, <laughs> I have been tinkering like a good gnomish engineer does, or, a, well, goblin, if you, if you so desire. But anyway... I have been tinkering around with the party in, in party enhancement uh, mod, and uh, basically what I've done is I've just gone into the settings here, and it is really, really extensive. The amount of options you have here are just crazy, and this little tab right here called General, this is fantastic. So basically what this does is this allows you to have automatic sorting, and you can also... Um, you can also make it so that companions are automatically at the top of your party, which is what I was missing because otherwise I literally have to go all the way to the bottom and then continually drag them up again and again and again. And obviously with the Distinguished Service mod, it makes it very tedious indeed. So I'm very, very happy that that is actually the case. So I have now all of my companions at the top and then all of my other people down below. Now bear in mind that we also have this little readout here that tells me exactly what kind of army composition I'm running with, which is also fantastic. Just look at this. I have a pretty balanced amount of infantry and archers at the moment, and I have a decent contingent of cavalry. So it's basically one for one in terms of infantry and archers, and then 50%, um, well, pretty much 50% of the cavalry, um, which is really nice in my opinion. I think that's a really, really cool thing. Now, there was a question in the comment section of the previous video, and I just want to address this real quick, just so that you, you know exactly what is happening and how, how that particular thing is done. You asked, how do I have so many units? Okay, so now here's the thing. The way that I have so many units is literally from taking prisoners and then just utilizing this button right here. Recruit all prisoners, that's it. Every single time, I go into my party screen to level up and indeed upgrade a bunch of troops. All I do is click this button as well, and then it just recruits those prisoners. And I don't care which prisoners I'm getting, no, no matter whether it's a, a looter or anything, anything at all, I will take it into my army and try to level it up as much as I possibly can. And that is the entire thing. That's the only way that I'm actually able to do, uh, to do that. And uh, that's that's the only th only reason why I have such a large army at the moment. Um, technically, what I could do is I could go to various garrisons, and I could technically do it that way, where I could just wait for my recruiter to bring units to my garrison. Oh wow! Okay, we're we're apparently declaring war against the Crusade. I can't do anything about this. If I say no, then it's going to cost me 700 influence. But I have to say yes. So there you go. I don't have 700 influence, of course. And uh, yeah, so basically that is my answer to that question because there's a variety of different ways you can get um, huge amounts of, of, of um, units into your army. And the way that I'm doing it at the moment is literally just recruiting prisoners. That's it. I'd recommend getting party screen enhancements if you can. That is probably one of the best mods that I have installed right now, with the exception of obviously Bannerlord Tweaks and a variety of other ones, because they all give extremely useful um, quality of life improvements all over the place, really. And it really makes a big difference. But um, yeah, party screen enhancements, great, great mod. And uh, as you can see, we actually have um, a little bit of a problem here. The Batanians are running around and doing some pretty significant damage. I'm not a big fan of that, thank you very much. So what I think I might do is take back this castle real fast, because this should be very, very easy for us to do. Let's get all these things built. There we are, very nice indeed. And uh, what we're going to be doing, obviously, after this, is I will be... Oh, look at that, we took a bunch of them prisoner, that's nice. Oh, they really want to... Um... <laughs> I think that that is actually hilarious. I'm going to decline because I would like to very much take this castle back beforehand. Because here's the thing. They are literally only offering me peace because they know that I'm going to take this back. And they know that they've also just lost 
a very large army on their side, and their combat strength has probably taken a pretty big hit as a, as a result of it. If we take a look at the kingdom screen right now, you can see the diplomacy, and you can see how things are going here. So obviously, Batania, as you can quite clearly tell, they are at war against four different factions. We are at war against the Brotherhood of the Woods and the Kuzate at the moment, apparently. We're also at war against Batania, of course. But um, yes, otherwise, how, where, where's, the, where's the combat strength? Where can I see that? Apparently, I can't see that for some reason. Uh, that, is, that, that is actually a bit weird. Uh, I would like to see the combat strength because that really would give us a good idea as to how, um, how we're doing. Uh, I, I, oh, stats. There we go. There it is. Okay, so Batania and Vlandia are actually pretty even in terms of their total strength. However, Vlandia is a little bit edging them out there. Um, the Kuzate, however, are extremely... Wow. Uh, they, are, they are pretty powerful at the moment. Ooh, Northern Empire is still doing very well. Western Empire is completely done. Azurai, wow, everyone seems actually pretty even. This is uh, probably the closest game in Bannerlord that I've had so far. Because mostly every single series I've had, there has been one clear outrunner that has completely destroyed everyone else within a very small amount of time. And this time, not so much. I think, you know what the reason for that is? I think diplomacy fixes is actually causing a, uh, a lot of drama in regards to that. I think it makes a big difference in who is able to snowball effectively, and it's making a yeah, it's making a huge difference to that. Anyway, as you can see, another ten prisoners here, eighteen troops being upgraded as well. Very nice to see that. And otherwise, we're just going to continue building our siege equipment. Ah, we might be having a little bit of a problem here. Okay, I'm going to have to get my trebuchets out as soon as possible now because they are, they're actually just, you know, they were actually just done just this very second. And uh, these two guys, they're going to be waiting for a large aha. These guys are coming over, as you can see. Yeah, this is, this is problematic. Okay, I'm going to have to actually leave the siege here. And we're going to have to run away because 900 units, I don't think I'm going to be able to fight them. Let's face it, I will not be able to fight such a large army. However, if the army turns around, wow, they have 186 horsemen. That is going to be so, so powerful. But yeah, if, they, uh, if the big army turns around, we should be able to prey upon the smaller armies. And then we'll see how that goes. But I am actually running out of money at the moment. So I guess what I'll do is actually just head on over to Ox Hall real quick because I have been doing quite a bit. Oh, okay. Well, should I should I just say yeah? <sighs> I don't really want to personally. I don't really want to do that. I think that that is um, a big waste because we actually lost territory in that particular engagement. And I didn't really want to do that. But I'm kind of thinking about our other vassals and I'm thinking how... How are they going to react to this? How are they going to continue surviving in these kinds of you know in these kinds of situations? So I guess I will just go for that, and we'll see what happens. Now, what I've also been doing is basically going to all the towns that I can, and pretty much just trying to upgrade Bruce's armor and weapons and you know varieties of other stuff as much as I possibly can. The scythe, however, that is going to get um, that is going to get. Uh, Let's put this on default. Thank you very much. But yeah, but that is going to get um, unequipped because it is just not good enough, in my opinion, to warrant being equipped for us. And instead, I'm going to look around for something a little bit better. As you can see right here, um, this scythe right here does piercing damage, and this does cutting damage. Now, this scythe is 59 piercing, which obviously is going to do much more damage in the grand scheme of things. So it would probably be a good idea for us to try and just look around for something, maybe even a two-handed weapon or something along those lines. That might be quite fun. As you can see, we're also using this. This is a new new weapon that we've just gained, and I'm going to be selling all of these things. Now, you may be wondering, how did I do this? Well, someone in the comments was actually very, very helpful, and um, I think you, you said that... Damage is the number one stat that you want to be looking for when smithing. So anytime you can increase 
the damage of a weapon, you're going to have a great time. You're going to have a really, really good time. And uh, that's exactly what we want to do. So I'm just going to let everyone take some stuff. And we're going to get 39,000 from this, which is really nice. And uh, I'm actually just going to show you real quick exactly what I've been making. So let me actually just see here. Oh, they're all in different places now. Oh, that's annoying, isn't it? Uh, yeah, they're all in different places because they've um, they've sorted them out differently. Okay, now this is also problematic. I have too many companions, and I now cannot see. As you can tell, I, I actually can't see the guy that I actually wanted to use for this. Oh, well, never mind. <laughs> I guess we'll just go with the guy that has the highest smithing skill that we have right now. Anyway, basically what I did was I just looked for swing cut damage and the most that you can possibly do. And then I increased the size of that because that is obviously going to increase the damage just by a small amount. And then I just went for the highest tier of uh, guard that gives us additional damage. So just go for one of these. And then we're also going to go for a bit of a grip here. That increases our damage by a little bit more too. And then we'll go for... One of these that also increases our damage. Ooh, now this increases our damage by a significant amount. Very nice indeed. Okay, so unfortunately, I can't do anything about that right now because I don't have any resources, but I just wanted to show you exactly what was going on. Hopefully, this guy can actually start increasing his, um, his smithing because we don't have anyone that actually has a huge amount of smithing now. Um, I would have to go into my party screen and actually move... Um, Thorgood back to the top of the list because that's the only reason why he is not actually there. So there's Thorgood of Doncaster. Come on now. There you are. Fantastic. Okay, so yeah, now, now I would be able to use him uh, technically, which is exactly what we want to do. But I'm going to go to Praven real quick first. And we are now at war against the Kuzate and no longer at war against the Western Empire as well, by the way, because I made peace with them too just to give our vassals more of a single-minded approach. I wanted to get them focusing on only one enemy at one time. I think that makes much more sense. So we're just going to be selling one of these two-handed swords. And I would like to buy some war horses as well, if at all possible. So we'll see if we can uh, do something about that. Okay, so uh, Thorgood is now here, thankfully, and um, now we can do what we want to do so we're just going to do this and we'll do we need to find something that increases the damage significantly these are all 117 oh that's 119 nice okay that's actually pretty significant Ooh, this actually increases damage by even more if you can believe that it increases damage by wow by a, such a, a massive amount that's really really good and what we're also going to do is we're going to take this and look at that 100 39 swing cutting damage that is insane and now what we're going to be doing is just refining a couple of pieces here a whole bunch we can actually do and let's get a couple more fine steel as well there we go and now we can forge it and we'll do a whole bunch of these as well because we can and i'm actually really really excited to see how much these are actually going to be because let's face it I think they're probably going to be quite a lot. Yes, they are probably going to be quite. Oh, actually, not as much as I um, not 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 as much as I thought. I guess what you need to do is you need to balance difficulty with damage. So the difficulty needs to be pretty high, but the damage also needs to be high because these ones right here, they they as you can see only have 121 cutting damage, and these have 136. But the difficulty of creating these swords was so much less, so it might very well be that you need to balance both of those out uh, relatively well. Anyway, I'm going to be heading on over to the Kuzate territory, and we'll see if we can do some damage to them. All right, so I'm doing something a little bit risky here. We're attempting to take an actual town from the Sturgeons because apparently the Vlandians wanted to declare war against them. So we decided, okay, fine. Who am I to stop them? I'm just their liege and leader, apparently. But, well, thanks to that wonderful policy, we uh, don't really have that much control over what we're currently doing in terms of 
war declarations and so on. So we're going to have to try and see if we can abolish that particular policy relatively soon so that we can have a little bit more control over what our faction decides to do and decides to go for. Unfortunately, they do have a lot of ballistas, and in my opinion, ballistas are probably some of the most powerful siege defense weapons because they are able to be built so incredibly fast. And as you can no doubt tell, they're actually dealing some pretty good damage to our trebuchets. So much damage in actual fact that they're actually getting them all the way destroyed. And I'm probably going to have to uh, move the new ones into reserve. Ugh. Yeah, I can't do that. Wait a minute. There we go. Let's build that one, then move that to reserve. There we go. Okay, fantastic. Okay, so yeah, as you can quite clearly see, though, they have less than a thousand units now. They had about 1,200 or so when I um, originally started um, besieging, or 1,100 or something like that, and uh, we have done a little bit of damage to their... Um, to their garrison itself, to their defenders and things, just purely from our trebuchets, doing some damage to the ballistas and the catapults and things like that. So anytime you can uh, do some damage, it's always a good idea to try and get those siege equipment, um, the siege equipment uh, I emplacements destroyed as much as you possibly can. There we go. We've got four more trebuchets. Let's do it. Come on, let's see how much damage we can do. Um, now, I'm not entirely sure because I don't think we've actually gone that far, but I don't know whether the developers have um, implemented a starvation system in sieges. So it could very well be that the starvation mechanics will actually provide us with a little bit of assistance here and there because, well, they only have, well, oh, they had, they had two days, but now they have three days apparently because we are indeed reducing their population a little bit by besieging them. But of course, they don't have too many ways of resupplying their food supply. So uh, it's a little bit uh, a little bit dicey. I don't really know whether that is going to make any difference whatsoever, but hopefully it will. And hopefully my three trebuchets will actually be able to get the walls down because I'm, I'm very eager to get in there. I'm very eager to get in there. Oh, look at that. My other trebuchet actually did finish construction, which is really nice. And technically what I could do, which is, in my opinion, pretty cool. I don't know whether they've changed the amount of units that die when you destroy something. No, it seems like they haven't. But generally, if you destroy a ballista, two to four units will be eliminated, dependent on how many uh, actual soldiers the game simulates are nearby to the ballista. And when you destroy a catapult, usually it's three to six, somewhere around there, um, units that will be lost from the defense, which in my opinion is a very cool system because being able to um, affect the garrison itself from outside on the world map without going into combat itself is a very nice way to do things, especially considering if you're playing that kind of character, if you're playing a commander-based character or a medic or an engineer, and you're not really that much into the whole combat aspect of things, then you can quite easily just sit back and have your siege equipment do most of the work, which I think is pretty cool. I like that. I like the ability to affect things without directly having to do so. And I think that's uh, generally something that we want to see much more of in the future as well. We want to see, you know, other kinds of options when it comes to siege warfare. We want to see these kinds of situations where you can literally just go and be like, okay, I'm going to pay a spy. You know, I'm going to pay a spy to go in there and poison their, their water supply. Or I'm going to you know, get, um, I don't know, get some some other kind of subterfuge going on where we sow discord inside the fief itself and it actually causes dissent in the ranks and it causes, I don't know, a, a certain percentage or a certain value of units to just desert the entire garrison. That that, that could also be something. Destroying food, food supplies could also be uh, a way to go too. Uh, I actually wonder whether I can jump over here. Can I? I, I don't really want to get stuck. That's the that's the main issue. Because if I decide to try and get in there and try to jump over the spikes and things, well, you know how that can happen. 
In Warband, you could probably get stuck pretty easily, but obviously in Bannerlord, it's a little bit different. So hopefully I won't get stuck this time. But I'm actually using a one-handed weapon here, which is a bit weird because usually I don't do that. But obviously in these close quarters, using a polearm is really not very useful at all. And we are, I think, going to be victorious here. I did take a look at the army composition of the defenders, and they don't really have anything too strong. Um, but the AI is once again being very much AI-esque, as you can no doubt tell from them being able to defend from most of my attacks, even though they probably shouldn't be able to in this situation, considering there's a lot of different attacks going on from a lot of different directions. Let's be a little bit careful here. I don't really want to get outnumbered and then killed and singled out. So hopefully I'm going to be able to just take these guys down. There we go. Yeah, it, it, I feel like the AI gets so much better when they are surrounded by others. Because what they're going to be able to do then is they'll be able to block for each other. And I don't know whether you've noticed that as well. Maybe you play the game. Maybe you've uh, seen some of my videos. You know, maybe you'll see that as well. Because there are a number of instances where you go to attack someone from behind, mind you. You know, because obviously you want to try and avoid their shield as much as you possibly can. Try to get a nice thrust in there or try to get a good slash with some nice momentum behind it. And then all of a sudden the opponent either turns around instantly to block your strike or they will have their neighbor which is right next to them they'll have their their friend standing right next to them shoulder to shoulder turn around and block for them which in my opinion is extremely unrealistic but um yeah i mean obviously that is going to happen every now and again because it is indeed a game it's not realistic in the real life sense but I would prefer to see less mechanical movement from the AI. I'd like to see them make more mistakes, even though generally they do tend to make quite a few mistakes and they're not that good in actual combat, but they are a little bit supernatural when it comes to defending against the player character, at least. And I got shot in the neck. I actually don't know how I got shot in the neck. Where was that? <laughs> I don't even know what I got killed by, to be honest, but whatever the case, um, I, I would like to see a little bit more natural movement from, from units when you're actually attempting to attack them. For example, this kind of situation right here, this is exactly what I'm talking about. If I were to come from behind here or from the side and try to, you know, get a bit of a flank action going on or something like that, then you can best bet... If I were to attack someone that didn't have a shield, one of their neighbors would be like, oh, but wait a minute, I have a shield, so I'm gonna block for my friend here. And yeah, okay, sure, some of the time, that will probably happen in real life too. But that is going to require a huge amount of coordination and everything for it to happen every single time, you know what I mean? I mean, I'm, I'm just wanting the game to be the best that it can possibly be and giving the player a feeling of natural immersion is also something that I feel like Bannerlord has done very very well so far in terms of atmosphere, in terms of um, weapon feel as well. Weapon feel is really nice. I feel like the weight behind a lot of the weapons is uh, pretty much perfect. I feel it's not. It doesn't feel doesn't feel floaty. It doesn't feel like um, you're just going to swing this thing and then immediately get damage out of it. Um, it. It has that that nice sort of impact behind it, especially with the two-handed weapons. And, um, you know, generally the environments are very, very cool. They do have a lot of atmosphere in the environments. The lighting is great. And uh, obviously the various factions, they all have a different kind of personality to them, which I very much enjoy too. However, I would say that those specific instances of AI either targeting the player specifically, which I think is, I, I, again, I think that that's okay if you are indeed the liege of a particular faction, but if you are just some random soldier in someone's army, then, um, you know, it's probably less likely for that to happen, but uh, it doesn't. It is all the same in that regard. So the AI does tend to target the player a bit too much for my liking and they also do tend to be a bit too defensive in sieges when they're standing next to each other so those two things could be worked on obviously but 
as we know, it is indeed early access and we don't have to worry about it because I'm sure the developers will handle it relatively well. And uh, Gamescom, oh yeah, yeah, Gamescom's actually been going on and uh, there's been a whole bunch of information about um, the uh, single player and the uh, the multiplayer as well. They did a couple of, uh, as far as I'm aware, they did a couple of live streams or something like that. I'm actually not sure um, when those were. Uh, I think I missed some of them, but um, yeah. That, uh, that That's pretty interesting, no? I think that's pretty interesting. And, and as long as they've got some people that know the game really, really nicely and uh, actually are, are fans of the game to to experience it, because obviously, you know, Gamescom is, is actually not being done in real life because of the whole global situation, then, um, you know, having it be online and having people that are passionate about the game and, and the development of it is definitely going to be helping a, a great deal. Now, <laughs> there is there's, there's one enemy, and I don't know where he is. Is he... Is he in the wall? Oh, no, never mind. He was actually behind the gate and he was stuck there the entire time. That is actually hilarious. Okay, anyway. <laughs> ah, yes. Uh, yeah, hopefully, anyway, as I said, hopefully the developers um, got some people that are actually passionate about the game and are going to be, um, you know, sticking with the game for, for many years to come. And uh, hopefully that will help to um, give good feedback, you know, on what is actually happening. Anyway, um, Imperial Legionaries. I think I'm going to get one of those. And I will definitely get a... Uh, should I get... Yeah, I'll get a Batanian Oath Sworn as well. Ooh, looks fun, looks fun. Okay, so there you go. That is a wonderful victory for us over a significant amount of opponents. And we have now taken Varcheg, which is fantastic because... Uh, I don't know whether you know this, if you've seen my original Warband series or if you've seen basically any of my Warband series, you'll know that sometimes I mention that this is, uh, I believe at least, the thief that turns into Wercheg in Warband. I think that this is indeed the thief that does that. So that is going to be extremely interesting to see um, how that goes because in the original series, the first time I ventured forth into Mountain Blade. I, uh, my first thief ever to capture, I believe, was Wercheck. I think that that was it, or it was at least the first thief that I created my own faction with, which I think is really cool. I am going to be uh, claiming this. I am going to be claiming this this time around. I think that that, um, I, I think it's kind of useful, especially considering Nevyansk Castle is it, it's pretty expensive at the moment my wages are quite heavy um for it and i could give it away you see i could give it away now because i do have a pretty significant amount of income from varcheg as it is but we're gonna just wait and see what happens with that because i don't really want to give it away too early and um then for us to have some problems gonna go for movement speed with athletics here my my athletics is just pitiful at 76 i mean it's pretty decent i guess but not as good as it could be of course otherwise um i'm actually not sure what to go for here i think considering i actually used one-handed quite a bit in that particular siege i'm actually going to improve vigor and one-handed i think this could be very very useful for us because being able to have a larger shield and um, being able to maybe swing a little bit faster. Uh, hit points increase by two. Ugh. Yeah, I, I, I don't really like that. Anytime that there is a trait that increases your HP by a flat value, I feel like it is just... It, it's, it's basically pointless, especially two. You know, two HP? What, what, what's that going to do? You know? I got shot for... What, what was it now? 60... 68 damage or something along those lines and uh, <laughs> let's just say that 2 HP is really not going to save me um, I mean obviously the um, the developers have done a very good job of fleshing out the traits that you, you have in these various um, various places you know so I instead of it literally being a case of just having that one trait to choose from and it doesn't really give you any any kind of bonus They've done a, a pretty nice job of actually increasing the usefulness of those traits. For example, these things right here give you two bonuses instead of just one. And I think that that's really nice. 
And I think that needs to be done to some of these other ones as well, but to, to, to do something a little bit different with them. Like, for example, this is really cool. 20% more damage while wielding a one-handed weapon without a shield. So if you want to go thematic and you want to role-play a, a famous duelist that goes around um, accomplishing tournaments the best you know that they possibly can, then you can do that. And there is a special skill you know, exactly for you, which I think is pretty cool. And like, for example, if you were to do like a challenge run or something like that, where you, where you must, you know, I don't know, win 10 tournaments within 30 days of starting the game, you know, 30 in-game days, that is, of starting the game, I think that could be really fun. And you definitely take the duelist trait as fast as you possibly could. However, this, this is all right. I mean, Melee troops gaining 5% more experience after every battle. I would definitely say that this is very useful. However, the hit points increase, not so much. So, obviously, you know, having the hit points increase is a very minor benefit. However, the 5% more experience obviously is pretty good. But this is basically a no-brainer in terms of the choice between these two. Because unless, as I say, you're role-playing some kind of famous duelist, and you're coming to Calradia to participate in, in tournaments and you have a very limited time to do so, you know, for a challenge run, for example, then this is obviously your go-to trait. However, for every other character ever, <laughs> you're most likely going to be taking trainer if you're specking into one-handed, and that's it. So there are, there are a couple of things to do in that regard, in my opinion, but otherwise, um, we're just gonna wait here for some time and uh, I will actually go into the town menu in just a second and see what's happening with our constructions because we, uh, we probably do need to do quite a bit. Oh yeah, there is actually a lot to do here and I'm going to be putting 10,000 in here as well. Okay, so we want to get a bonus to construction, don't we? So let's get some workshops up and running. I'm gonna stop. Uh, this is a bonus to food limit. That's actually pretty good. Um, I don't know how long this is gonna take. So I'm actually going to just get that gone. This is a plus 10% bonus to taxes. Yeah, now towns are obviously much better than, than castles in regards to what they actually have available to give you additional things. So for example, taxes and and food and influence and so on and so forth. Look at this, you actually get additional additional influence just from constructing various buildings as well, which is gonna be very, very useful for me. And this is not so good, so I'm gonna get rid of that. How long is this gonna take? Seven days? Are you serious? Seven days? That's pretty harsh. Oh well, never mind. I guess we'll go for it. And, uh, and there you go, we've taken Varchek, which I think is pretty cool. So now what we're gonna do is, I'm actually gonna go and we are going to disband the army. Boom, we have 473. Wow, that's actually quite a lot. 473 influence, that's pretty decent. And what I would like to do, ideally, is kick out Death Art. I would like to kick Death Art out of Vlandia because he is kind of annoying. He is very strong, however, that's the problem. He has a lot of units that can potentially help in the war effort against our various enemies. Um, but as you can no doubt see, it's a 7% chance, I believe, that that's going to work. So highly unlikely we'll be able to make it happen. But um, I, I kind of feel like if his fiefs were given to other people, they would probably make much more benefit from them but yeah maybe that's just me maybe that's just me anyway um as you can quite clearly tell however uh, the sturgeons have been completely dismantled by the northern empire the northern empire actually seems extremely strong right now which is kind of interesting because i don't believe we've ever really seen the northern empire do a huge amount or maybe i'm misremembering because maybe they they have but i always feel like the southern empire does the most and seems to be the strongest out of the Empire factions. But um, the Northern Empire does seem to be showing up quite heavily here. And so in the next episode, I'm probably going to try and take Revel and hopefully Ustakol Castle as well. Because then we can further consolidate our territory here. And if the Batanians do declare war again, I will try to take Flintog Castle as well. So that our supply line is unbroken as much as it possibly can be. Anyway, that's going to be it. I thank you very much for watching and I'll see you next time.